it's the new year. You've eaten and drunk your own body weight in mince pies and sherry, and now you feel as fat as a house. You're desperate to lose weight, but where do you start? Crash diets and fast diets and fed diets are so appealing. You can't go around counting the number of calories. The best way to do a workout is to do very short bursts. Fat is not something to be scared of. Having one unit of alcohol a day decreases your risk of coronary heart disease. With a quarter of UK adults now classed as clinically obese, the diet and fitness industry is worth a gobsmacking £6 billion every year. Whatever we're doing, it's not working. But don't worry, we're here to help by revealing the shocking lies behind the diet and exercise business. Yes, find out how exercising might break your back. If you're not doing it right, you could be out forever, basically. I want you to think of a disc as a donut. Can you see it's coming out? The real dangers of crash diets. Most of those people regain the weight that they lost. Yo-yo dieting is actually dangerous. Why there's no such thing as a superfood. We might think a goji berry from Brazil is a superfood, and in Brazil they probably think broccoli from Northamptonshire is a superfood. None of these things will lead to weight loss. And in some cases, how to cheat death. And some of them could be very dangerous. Worst case scenario is actually death. Will these be the last two hours you ever spend as a couch potato? Or might it be safer to stay put with a remote and a big bag of crisps? Well, watch the big fat lies about diet and exercise and find out. It could just save your life. Losing weight offers up an overwhelming variety of options, from fad diets to diet clubs and even surgery. Although how effective they are is a matter of debate. But there is one guaranteed way to help lose the pounds. Exercise can be important to losing weight. It's that basic equation of calories in versus calories out. So if you're not reducing your calories in so much, you have to increase your calories out, and exercise is a way of doing that. I think exercise is absolutely crucial to losing weight. First of all, because of the simple science, you are burning the calories. So you are using up that energy that you've taken in. Easy, right? More exercise means burning more calories equals weight loss. Exercising to burn calories is a very bad strategy because it takes a lot of hard work to burn enough calories to kind of warrant you having the cupcake that you saw before you walked into the gym. There is a misconception that when you run, you are burning shed loads of calories. You're probably not burning as many calories as you think. In fact, a 12 stone man would need to run for 30 minutes to burn off just 300 calories. Now, 300 calories sounds like a lot. It's actually, it's, it's not a huge amount. 300 calories is probably the equivalent to a muffin. So you could really undo all the hard work you've done in the gym just by going to the gym cafeteria and having a muffin. All you're doing is miscalculating how many calories you've burned and how many you're eating. So it's quite possible that having a regular exercise routine could actually make you fatter. It's never simple, is it? What we tend to do is we tend to exercise to eat. What we should be doing is eat in order to exercise. We're getting it around the wrong way. The reason we put on weight often when we work out is because we see eating as a reward. Eating is not a reward. Eating is something that should be positive, it should be healthy, and it should be fueling our brains and our muscles to move. Don't see food as a reward. See it as something you enjoy. Maybe separate it from exercise. Think, I'm going to have a piece of that cake. But know that you also keep your fitness up, that the rest of the time that you eat a healthy, balanced diet, plenty of fruit and vegetables, good lean protein, and then, you know, the odd... Cake, biscuit, ice cream, it's not going to make much difference. Next, one of the most unpleasant downsides of running, the nipple effect. Oh, jogger's nipple. Who hasn't had a bit of jogger's nipple? Jogger's nipple, unsurprisingly, affects mainly men. That's because most women, when they run, will wear a bra, hopefully a sports bra, but men tend to just have the T-shirts on, and it's just friction. If you're wearing heavy cotton and you get sweaty, the cotton really will drag on your nipples, and they will get sore, and you literally can see people with blood on their nipples. The first half marathon I ever did, I had uh, two streams of blood coming all the way down my top, and I'd lost half a nipple. I saw my husband complete his first half marathon. It was like something out of Halloween. How unpleasant. So apart from running topless or not running at all, is there anything you can do to stop this unfortunate abrasion? 
This is something that you can control yourself. Um, you need to wear the right clothing. Wear a really light top. You don't need to wear heavy cotton tops anymore. You can just wear a really light top that's less likely to, to cause that friction. But if you do find that you suffer from it, you, there are solutions. You can use Vaseline, you can use plasters, band-aids. Just be aware that if you are a man with a hairy chest, taking those off could be maybe just as painful as jogger's nipple. I've run a lot of marathons, and thankfully over time I've kind of worked out that you do need to Vaseline up. Amazingly, around 80% of all joggers will get the dreaded nipple rub at some point. If you've uh, suffered from it, you need to make sure that it's kept clean, that you dress it. Like any wound, the joggers nipple can get infected, so do be careful. Because I kind of wore away the top of the nipple, it did grow back, but it's grown back bigger than it was before. So I've got a slightly more <laughs> erect left nipple now. Now, I hope you have a strong stomach, as our next shocking fact reveals a lot of grub is infested with, well, grubs. There have always been contaminants in our food. We just never used to know about it. But don't worry, it's not just bugs. Droppings and rodent hairs and bits of skin. Yummy, yummy in my tummy. So at a time when you're shopping for those ingredients for your new diet and wondering how many wriggly bits might end up on your plate, here are some grisly stats to chew over. Peanut butter can contain 145 bugs per jar or five or more rodent hairs. Tomato juice can contain 10 fly eggs per glass or five fly eggs and one maggot. Canned mushrooms can contain over 20 or more maggots of any size per 100 gram. OK, so it might be organic matter we're digesting, but given that we're eating an estimated pound of bugs a year, is it safe? Bugs contain a lot of protein, so in some countries, like over in China, for instance, or Thailand, they're actually a frequent part of the diet. They make up a large proportion of it. I think we may be going down the road where we are going to see more bugs in our actual diet one day. I'm not sure yet. One of the main supermarkets are starting to produce a edible bug range. I would much rather find a slug in my lettuce and know that it's organic or a frog in my lettuce and know that it's clean than something that's been absolutely laced with pesticides and is completely sterile. I mean, these things grow in the ground. I mean, where do you think a lettuce comes from? They're grown in the ground. They don't cause any harm to us whatsoever. Still, rat hairs and fly wings in my breakfast. Ooh, yuck. Join us shortly to find out why a full English might be just the ticket and why counting calories doesn't really work. Just counting the calories and looking at the numbers alone is just joyless. Granny wasn't counting calories and there was no obesity in their generation. Ever wanted the perfect body but couldn't face hours of slog at the gym? Well, this next regime could be for you. HIIT, H-I-I-T, stands for High Intensity Interval Training. Opposed to the old way we used to think, where you know, do long runs, do long, drawn-out workouts to work as hard as you can, people are actually changing their mind about this and thinking that the best way to do a workout is to do very short bursts, maybe 10 seconds of intense exercise, a break, 10 seconds of intense exercise, a break, and continue that cycle for about four to eight minutes. It's basically a good way of getting as much exercise in as in a short amount of time. Sounds a bit too good to be true. So is it? It increases your metabolism, and because of the intensity that you're using, you're going to start burning fat. Now, this is all to do with um, the release of cortisol in the blood. Cortisol, otherwise known as the stress hormone, is what we release during exercise, and it's also involved with muscle repair and fat storage. Short bursts of exercise release small amounts of cortisol in short bursts, and that is thought to be beneficial to the heart and beneficial to gaining muscle mass. So the overall thinking is that high-intensity interval training is the best way to do it. You don't need any equipment. You can do it in your own home. The best thing with HIIT training is it builds muscle at the same time as burning fat. So it really is the answer to all our fitness prayers, then? I mean, if anyone would suggest to you you've got the choice of either doing an hour in the gym or eight minutes of exercise, you'd immediately think, eight minutes, easy, anyone can do that. But it's eight minutes of intervals of very intense exercise, and, I mean, it absolutely wears you out. It's a lot of hard work. An American study in 2017 showed that taking an hour of exercise and squeezing it into a minute 
doesn't bring us pleasure. It becomes a chore or a punishment, which makes it much less sustainable. And therefore, we're more likely to give up on exercise altogether. If for you, HIIT training is really hard and you dread doing it, is it the right type of exercise for you? I'm not sure. It's important you find something that you enjoy that you're going to stick to, because that's sustainable. Current research into coffee suggests it may have enormous health benefits. Drinking three to five cups of java a day might reduce the risk of heart attack by as much as 21%. But as ever, there is a small caveat. One in five coffee cups contain number twos. Office coffee cups are notorious for being bacterial breeding grounds and there is some research to show that they have isolated E. coli from the office coffee cup, which, I mean, E. coli is a pretty nasty bug. It can cause abdominal cramps, diarrhoea or even more serious illnesses. Ugh, gross. But where's all this nastiness coming from? We all see people in the office using the toilets and they're not quite as hygienic as you are. You know, people go in and they come out and you think, hang on, you've not washed your hands. These are the very people that are going back and helping themselves to your coffee cup and the spoon and wiping their hands all over it. And there's traces of faecal matter taken from the toilet and they're transferring it back into the office and onto your coffee cup. Steer clear, keep your own coffee cup, wash it and don't use the office dish towel. Yes, if you don't observe proper privy protocol, you could be spreading your faecal matter around the finance department. Every day, a whopping 34% of us Brits skip breakfast. Not a problem, you might say. The calories I'll save will make me skinny. But what if missing breakfast can actually make you fat? A lot of people are definitely guilty of skipping breakfast. And actually, for the majority of us, eating breakfast would be something that would be very beneficial to us. So we would think much quicker, we would control our blood sugar levels, control our appetite, it would help our waistline, etc., etc. As a fitness expert, I would say breakfast is vital. It really is important to kickstart your day with some energy, get your body working. Even if you just get a banana in your system, black coffee, and the tip is a pint of water. Start your day with a pint of water, hydrate your body, get yourself functioning. We've done research in children. Uh, we found those that eat breakfast regularly on school days are thinner overall, have a lower BMI. They are more active throughout the day and they engage in more activity. So it's a very, very simple intervention to start the day well with a good breakfast. You see, whether it's a bowl of muesli or the full English, you're really doing yourself a favour. We've actually evolved biologically to love a big breakfast. The trouble with not eating breakfast is then later on in the day you're going to be much more hungry. So your day has just started badly and then 10.30, 11 o'clock, you're starting to get very hungry. You're going to eat something then, which is invariably going to be a snack. We know that if you do miss meals, your blood sugar level drops. That puts us all in a bad mood. So actually eating regularly and sustaining a good blood sugar means you're more likely to diet successfully. So I would say that actually skipping breakfast is a bad idea. Next, have a banana. But not too many, mind, because our favourite healthy bendy yellow fruit might just turn you radioactive. This doesn't mean that if you eat bananas, you're going to glow in the dark or anything like that. Bananas contain extremely large amounts of potassium-40, a radioactive substance that turns our bananas positively nuclear. One or two bananas are fine, aiding digestion and metabolism. Put wolf down too many and you could end up with hyperkalemia, the terrifying symptoms of which are nausea, irregular heartbeat and cardiac arrest. You'd need to eat 10 million bananas in one sitting to die of radioactive poisoning. So it's very, very unlikely to happen. But if you want to err on the side of caution when you're counting out your five a day, try not to go bananas. Bananas are an actual isotope. It's probably impossible to eat that much and become radioactive from a banana. I'd worry more about being close to a phone antenna or going through an airport scanner. I don't think people need to worry. In fact, I want to be encouraging people to eat more fruit rather than being worried that they're having too much. If you've ever looked at the info label on the food you get from the supermarket, chances are it'll tell you how many calories it has. But why? We've all heard of them. But what do they really mean? And can they help you lose weight? 
Calories are a measure of how much energy something has. So if you were to take that piece of food and burn it as a fuel, how much energy would it actually be able to produce? It's really how much energy a food is going to give you. In terms of weight gain and weight loss, a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. There are nine calories in fat and only four in sugar. But if you eat 500 calories, it doesn't matter where they come from, your weight gain, your weight loss will be the same. Calorie counting should work as a diet, theoretically, because it is basic science. You are using up more calories than you're taking in. The Department of Health recommends the average calorie intake for men should be 2,500 and 2,000 for women. So stick to that and watch the pound slide off, eh? Well, shockingly, no. Counting calories might very well be counterproductive to losing weight. The recommendations around calories are based on reference men and women, 70 kilo man, 55 kilo woman, that doesn't really exist anymore. The amount of calories that we should be eating really varies considerably among the population. It depends on things like your gender, it depends on the amount of exercise that you do, it even depends on things like stress. So there are a huge amount of things that can influence the amount of calories that we need, and there is no one arbitrary number that will be the exact number that someone should eat every single day. Athletes that we deal with will be eating five to 7,000 calories a day when they're training, um, and in competition they'll be eating even more. I'd always advocate against fixating on a number because it's pretty unhelpful. Because if you eat 1,500 calories of sweets and nothing else, you'll be malnourished. So it's not just about the number, it's about the balance you bring into that number and how you eat it. Just counting the calories and looking at the numbers alone is just joyless. And food is so much more than that. It's pleasure, it's, it's sociable, and just looking at it for its calorie numbers is, is no way to live. You can't go around counting the number of calories you're having at every single meal. It's not a sustainable approach. So yes, there is definitely evidence for how many calories people should be eating, and we can work that out, but I try to stay away from that as much as possible. Granny wasn't counting calories, and there was no obesity in their generation. So no, I don't think we should count calories at all. We've been doing this now for a couple of decades, and it's not working clearly. Because if it was, the population, most people don't choose to be fat. The population wouldn't be getting more obese, and there wouldn't be more type 2 diabetes. So something else is clearly going on. I think in an ideal world, I would say, let's just do away with calories. Don't look at them, don't think about them, just eat a balanced diet. Remember how laborious making a salad used to be, wasting all those precious seconds chopping a lettuce or plucking some tender leaves before putting them into a bowl? It really makes you wonder how we ever survived as a species before bag salad, doesn't it? But this convenience comes at a price. We now are at a point in the environment where we do need pesticides on the food in order to keep them safe for consumption. So there's a big balance there and it can be quite shocking when you hear what goes on to an item of food. Chlorine is used in bag salad as a way to keep the bugs away. It's not something we can really avoid if you're buying bag lettuce and you want convenience. I mean, we get chlorine in our tap water. We swim in chlorine. Yes, but do we really need our salads washed in a chlorine solution, a staggering 20 times stronger than the average swimming pool? There's a rise in people purchasing packeted salads, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about things like chlorine within those bags. Actually, you can wash those off, and it's totally harmless to the actual individual themselves. But there is a good debate now that we should be reducing plastic consumption, and we could also be building these salads ourselves rather than turning to a packaged item. Buy all vegetables every week so you get different quantities of veg. That cuts out the stress of having to buy it. And also, you're getting all different veg every week to experiment with. Organic vegetables have more nutrition in than non-organic counterparts. Probably get a lot more for your money, be able to bulk it up with a lot more tasty items, I'd say, a lot of variety in your salad, because we're not getting enough variety every day, and a bag of leaves, essentially, could be bulked up with vegetables too. We all know how exercise keeps us trim and does wonders for our mental health. Well, until all that warm, sweaty moisture manifests itself into a genital parasitic fungus, of course, also known as Jokic. No, not the dashing Serbian tennis champ, although it is kind of associated with balls. 
jock itch is essentially a fungal infection that affects the groins and the upper thighs. I mean, the medical term is tenia cruris. The fungus that, that causes this loves a warm a moist environment. What's causing this soreness is wearing tight cycling shorts and the issues with, with your balls, basically, and, and keeping them cool. You need to keep them cool. Jock itch is a diagnosis that's incredibly rewarding for a doctor to make. We're able to tell people, no, it's not an STI. It's not a sexually transmitted infection. It's often related to having an athlete's foot, so the, the fungal spores hitch a ride on underwear, up come the, the underwear to our groins, the spores think, oh, this is nice. It's nice and moist, it's nice and, it's nice and warm. I'll settle here. Oh, and just one more thing. A friend of mine has a similar problem, and she, I mean, sorry, he, <laughs> asked if the ringworm of the groin can be treated. Keep the area clean and dry and use an antifungal preparation to treat it. Thanks, Doc, will do. I mean, I'll pass it on. The remedy, not the jock itch. Join us shortly and discover the best way to milk a beaver and how eating too much fruit and veg can actually make you fatter. To say that fruit is healthy is a bit vague. There are certainly people who don't lose weight because they eat too much fruit. Vegetarians and vegans, look away now. Eating too much fruit and veg might actually make you fat. There are certainly people who don't lose weight because they eat too much fruit. Something like a banana digests down into surprising amounts of sugar. They could easily be an equivalent of about five teaspoons of sugar in a banana. Once the body's gone past three teaspoons of sugar, it goes into fat storage. So your body isn't designed to cope with huge amounts of fructose. And you shouldn't have five pieces of fruit. You should have three maximum, and they should be berries. To say that fruit is healthy is a bit vague because it depends where on the sugar spectrum is the fruit you're going to have. And in general, a shortcut is tropical fruits spend longer in sunshine making sugar. Some health experts, however, suggest you simply can't get enough of a good thing. The sugar in fruit is absolutely no problem. In fruit, you have sugar, but it's intrinsically within the cell, so it doesn't affect your blood sugar levels as sugar would in a chocolate bar, for example. So actually, fruit is a very nutritious source of vitamins and minerals and good sugar as well. An interesting study showed that actually the more vegetables and fruit you eat, the lower your risk of dying. So you can't really eat enough vegetables and fruit. The recommended daily allowance of fruit and vegetable is just five a day. But if you look across Europe, you'll find that that recommendation varies quite considerably. So some countries will actually be at 10. And I actually do believe that that number 10 is probably more where we should be leading towards or somewhere in between. The chances are that most people will not be having enough fruit and vegetable rather than having too much. So I don't think we should be at all worried about people having too much fruit and vegetables in a day. We should be worrying more about the fact that they're having too much processed foods rather than fruit and veg content. There's no damage really that that fruit and veg can do to you, whereas there is a lot of damage that that processed food can be doing to you. As a nation, we're a funny breed, especially on holiday, seeking out a full English or fish and chips as we sun ourselves on a Mediterranean beach. But if we were to try more of the local cuisine, we'd probably find not only does it taste delicious, but it might just save our lives. The Mediterranean diet is the one diet that there is very strong scientific evidence for that it is healthy. When their diet or a similar diet is transferred into other populations, those people also tend to enjoy the health benefits of it. It is exactly balanced in every way. It's very fresh, it's unprocessed ingredients, it's not high sugar, and it doesn't eliminate any food group. So yeah, it's one of the most healthy diets. It includes a lot of full fat dairy products, it includes a lot of nuts, it includes a lot of oils. Those are the fats that in this country people are trying to cut out. And you have a direct contrast to show that this is actually a much healthier way of eating. It's got a lot of good whole grains in there for a lot of fibre, a lot of vegetables and a lot of olive oil. And we know that olive oil now is linked to cardiovascular benefits. There is loads of evidence to show that people who live in Mediterranean climates live longer and are healthier, fewer heart problems, less diabetes, fundamentally just much healthier. 
but that's not actually a weight loss diet. That's a way of life. The other thing with the Mediterranean diet per se is that, you know, it was eaten in the Mediterranean. Uh, there was sunlight, so we're getting adequate vitamin D. We know vitamin D can be low in people who've got obesity. We know that Mediterranean cultures tend to have a low level of stress are not rushing around from the minute they get up through their Twitter feeds, through the Facebook, not taking a lunch break or eating, rushed at their computer, finishing, trying to rush to get home before collapsing in front of the sofa. That's not the Mediterranean lifestyle. I think what's really, really important is that we can't just think of diet as a way of keeping healthy. In addition to following a Mediterranean diet, also it's important to think about not smoking, only drinking alcohol within recommended amounts taking regular exercise, and also getting enough rest, relaxation and sleep in our lives. And maybe it's true that our Mediterranean cousins have a better chance of, of following the whole lifestyle, and that's why many of us would do well to, to follow likewise. For years we've been told that it's essential for our health to monitor our cholesterol, but things are about to change for this much maligned molecule. It's become so accepted that we just talk about cholesterol as if it's fat. You know, we say, oh, yeah, that food's great because it lowers my cholesterol. Oh, that food's not so good because it puts my cholesterol up. But it's so much more nuanced than that, right? Cholesterol is a vital molecule for the body. Our cells need a certain amount of cholesterol in order to maintain their fluidity, in order to be able to, to function properly. So most cells in your body, in their outer membranes, have some cholesterol in them. People talk about oestrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Where do these come from? They're all made from cholesterol, right? So cholesterol is vital for us in our bodies. So we can't live without it, but can high levels of the stuff still be bad for us? High cholesterol is bad. It is linked to heart disease. It is linked to the firing up of our arteries, both in the brain and in the heart. So yes, high cholesterol is bad. I think we've become too scared of cholesterol and we just see cholesterol as a, as a, as a dangerous thing that's going to kill us all. And again, we're changing our views about that. Science is developing, science is evolving to say, actually, we don't need to be worrying so much about cholesterol. It used to be thought that the cholesterol that we ate in foods was causing high cholesterol in the body. We now know that's not true. What you eat has very, very little effect on your cholesterol levels. If you eat a very high fat diet, your cholesterol levels might go up a tiny bit. If you eat almost no fat, they go down a very small amount. So the body adjusts to the cholesterol that you eat in foods. So if you eat too much cholesterol, your body will stop making its own cholesterol. If our bodies regulate it so well, surely it means that the whole furore around high cholesterol is just a myth. Now in some people, probably 20% of the population, they have a very pronounced response to saturated fat in foods. And so for those people, having too much um, butter, lard, red meat, etc., can really increase their risk of LDL cholesterol. And that is certainly a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. If you want a healthy cholesterol profile, you need to choose your parents very carefully because it's genetic. Ice cream? You'll never lose weight eating that. But as we've already learnt, everything in moderation. So would you like some beaver's anal gland with that? Well, maybe don't go for the vanilla. Castoreum, the sticky substance that's released from the glands around the anus of a beaver, tastes remarkably like vanilla. Yes, castoreum is a yellowy, smelly substance beavers secrete from sacs at the base of their tail. I've run out of vanilla pods. I'll just see if the secretion of the anal gland of a beaver tastes similar. And Oh, actually, it does. Did they suddenly walk past the beaver and smell vanilla? <laughs> Often referred to on packaging as natural flavouring, this rectal drizzle takes on a more pleasant, fruity nuance when diluted in alcohol. And so those clever US food boffins thought it might work well as a yummy flavouring ingredient. And just so you know, to extract this bum gloop, you first have to anaesthetise your beaver and then milk its glands. The actual process of extracting a vanilla flavour from a beaver sounds a bit gross, really. That is it. I am never eating food again, ever. Think diet drinks do what they say on the tin? Bad news, sorry, they just make you fatter. 
If you look at diet drinks, you very rarely see skinny people drinking them. You see a lot of overweight people drinking them. Diet drinks contain artificial sweeteners like saccharin and aspartame. These send a signal to the brain telling you that you've eaten something sweet and that can lead to insulin spikes which can lead to fat being stored within the body. Now, there's a big debate at the moment as to whether sweeteners can increase appetite and interact with our gut microbiome but we don't quite have those answers yet. They're chemical, they're fake and they do not help you to lose weight. But surely if it says diet on the tin it must be better for you than drinking the full fat version. I mean, a 500 milliliter bottle of a certain famous cola contains a staggering 13.5 sugar cubes. Perhaps for a lot of people out there, they may be better off having the actual drink itself less frequently. So everything in moderation rather than turning to an excessive consumption of something just because it's lower in calories. But, you know, we're designed to drink water. And I know if you drink lots of Diet Coke, it's, it tastes really boring. But if that's all you drink, you'll actually find you like it. Right, time for that early morning run. Trainers, check. Water bottle, check. Pre-exercise stretches, uh... Hmm. Stretching for exercise has undergone a bit of a revolution. A while ago, people would have thought stretching before a run, you would stand on one leg and pull, you know, pull your other heel to your bum and, you know, stretch out your calf muscle. And actually what you're doing is just putting stress on cold muscles. Touching your toes, you know, pulling your arm back and things like that, there's no benefit of that, of doing it before exercise. There's lots of research which basically has shown that stretching in before and warm-up doesn't work. So to warm up properly, you need to move. You're going to go for a long run, then do some high knees, get your knees going, go for a little jog, and it kind of warms up the body. At least you need five to ten minutes of warm-up before you can stretch a muscle, and this is a fact. OK, this is a fact that if a muscle is not warm enough, you're going to damage that muscle if you stretch you are kind of snapping muscle fibers in here and you, you, this actually could be irreversible. Stretching does have its place though. It might not be in a warm up, but it does have its, have its place. Once you finish with the exercise, you have cooled down, then stretch is good. Cool down is important. It just helps with your recovery really. So if you've got an exercise plan and you know that you're doing some more exercise the next day by cooling down, stretching out those muscles. They'll just help keep your muscles safe and, and make it possible for you to keep exercising at the intensity you want to exercise at. Now, the truth behind antioxidant supplements. Yes, they may have exacerbated more cancers than they've prevented. High levels of vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, could actually promote the development of prostate cancer. But what exactly is an antioxidant? Where can they be found? And why do we hold so much store by them? So antioxidants are substances that fight free radicals in the body, and too many free radicals in the body we know leads to potentially things like cancer and ageing because they can damage substances in our cells, whether that's proteins or DNA or other structures in the cell. Essentially, they are vitamins and minerals that are found in our fruit and vegetables, and there are tons of research out there that supports the fact that they are beneficial for our health, that they protect us from cellular damage, they can help with our lifespan even. But that doesn't mean we isolate them into one single antioxidant or one single food group. Well, antioxidants sound like they may really work. They've become a byword for healthy. So why might they be a health risk? When we try and isolate these antioxidants into supplements, our body just doesn't like it. And actually, some of the trials that have been done have shown that supplementing with antioxidants can actually increase your risk of some cancers. Large studies have repeatedly shown that, with the possible exception of vitamin D, antioxidant supplements have negligible positive effects on healthy people. And supplements such as vitamins A, E and beta-carotene even seem to slightly raise the risk of disease and early death. The research shows that you're actually more likely to die if you supplement with antioxidants than if you don't. So it shows that too much of a good thing is definitely going to be a bad thing. Despite current thinking, antioxidant business is booming. What was already a $2.9 billion industry in 2015 is expected to soar to $4.5 billion by 2022.
As long as you're not living on a chemical waste site, you're probably not gonna have that many free radicals charging around your body that you need to start piling in antioxidants. So it appears you'd be much better off eating a wide range of whole foods, including lots of fruit and veg, rather than overdoing the supplements. Coming up, can you actually think yourself thin? And why detox should probably be left to your internal organs. You're detoxing, I'm detoxing as we speak. You don't need to do anything more. I don't know how convinced I am about drinking juices that are going to detoxify your body. Detoxify your body of what? Our next diet is what you may call a bit of a slow burn. Its beginnings go back to 1944 with a mission statement to stop the exploitation of animals by man. Yes, it's vegetarianism's hardcore cousin, veganism. A vegan diet is a diet that omits animal produce, essentially. So it can be done for ethical reasons, sustainability reasons, even animal welfare. You can get more plant-based produce in your diet, increase your fibre consumption. The average Briton's getting around 17 to 18 grams of fibre a day. We should be aiming for 30. Having a full vegan diet means you're going to be having an awful lot of fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds, you're going to have a lot of fibre, it's satisfying. Uh, you will have a, a fair amount of food that doesn't contain too many calories. So yes, you will potentially reduce your calorie intake. For many years, veganism was the preserve of a dedicated few easily dismissed as deluded hippies. But recently it's hit the mainstream with the number of people identifying as vegan in the UK increasing by an incredible 360% in the past decade. Veganism is on the rise. The problem you have with that is that people necessarily aren't that educated and they're looking to think, oh, that's veganism, I'll try that. Vegan diets can lack essential nutrients, so iron, B12, and also obviously lack the protein factor. So you have to be quite planned if you're going to go on a vegan diet. What I tend to find in my clinical practice is that people who do vegetarianism and veganism just don't do it well. So they're actually, they've excluded a big food group and they're not balancing the rest of their diet out properly. I know a lot of vegans that don't have a very healthy diet. They would just eat chips because chips can be vegan or a bag of crisps that are also vegan. It doesn't really work that way. If you're wanting to become vegan, then you need to make sure that you're approaching it in a very balanced and holistic way. You could be at risk of becoming deficient in a lot of different micronutrients, and that's your vitamins and your minerals. You should definitely not do veganism if you are just wanting to lose weight, because there's much more to it than that. If you feel unable to follow the full vegan mantra, but want some of the benefits, then don't worry. The increase of another Aryan may be for you, the flexitarian. Of course, nowadays, a lot of people will be part-time vegans, which is an absolutely valid choice as well, where they will be plant-based much of the time, but occasionally have animal products when either they have uh, less choice or they fancy it. There's nothing wrong with increasing the amount of vegetables and fruit because the average person in the country is still not getting their five a day. If we can encourage that in any way possible, that's great. It's not about thinking what you can take out of your diet, it's about thinking what you can put into it. In 490 AD, a messenger called Philippides ran 26.2 miles before collapsing and dying in front of the Greek assembly. Not an auspicious start to the very first marathon. Marathon runners are still losing their lives today in their superhuman efforts to get fit and cross the finishing line. Obviously, it's incredibly sad if somebody does die doing the marathon, but generally it's an undetected heart condition that they could have died doing, doing anything, running for the bus or you know, skydiving or whatever. Running lengthy time and lengthy distance is different. It's different. You are not relying on your muscles. You are relying on your cardiovascular system, and that is your heart. If you don't know how good your heart is, it's a chance, it's a big chance you're taking. It really isn't advisable to just leap up from your armchair, change your slippers for trainers, and run 26 miles. They are a very serious event, and they shouldn't be taken lightly. There are training plans available on the internet. You can pick up training plans from charities if you're running a charity place. But, you know, and a marathon will take you anything, depending on how fit you are, from two and a half to five, six hours. It's not something that you should venture into lightly. Read up about it, learn about it, maybe join a marathon running club so that you know 
how to train properly, how to fuel your body, how to recognise the signs that things are not working as they should be. Running a marathon is something that is achievable for a lot of people. And you don't have to run it in three, four hours. You can do it in six hours. And I think we just have to take it into perspective. It's like anything. It doesn't matter if it's a long distance charity bike ride or, or whether it's climb, climbing Mount Everest. The majority of the work is in the preparation. Fruit juice. Now, surely that's good for us, isn't it? I mean, it's fruit for pity's sake, squeezed into a glass. I think in terms of sugar content, fruit juices are worse than fizzy drinks. Fruit juices are not great for us. They have a high content of sugar, and that's because basically all of the good stuff has been taken out, and pretty much what you're left with is sugar. The whole fruit is always going to be better than drinking a juice, simply because you've got more fibre, and we don't get enough fibre. We get, on average, 18 grams a day, and we need 30. Interestingly, drinking three juices still counts as only one of your five a day because of the lack of fibre. Damn and blast! I thought a nice glass of OJ was all of my five a day. But it turns out it rots your teeth and leads to type 2 diabetes and has more sugar than a can of pop. Fruit juices contain a huge amount of sugar. I think they found that there's more sugar in grape juice and I think in apple juice than there is in cola. In fact, you'd be wise not to trust juices labelled as 100% pure or pure squeezed because many big commercial juice manufacturers are actually making a completely processed product. They've also been stripped of nutrients. I mean, they're not high in nutrients. I mean, you look at the labels on fruit juices, they're made from concentrates. So they're stored in warehouses and in factories as they're being processed for long, long periods of time, and they end up being depleted of vitamins and, and nutrients. But what about the good old smoothie? That's got to be healthy, surely. It's baby food, isn't it? It's liquidised food for babies. Why can't we just eat the whole food? Why do we have to blend it thinking it contains extra nutrients just because we put it through a blender? It doesn't. People who have a high amount of fructose, and this is one of the dangers with smoothies, can actually develop something called fatty liver syndrome, and that's pretty much the same as drinking too much alcohol. Oh, by blending fruit, the natural sugars are released and become free sugars, boringly the kind we should all be cutting down on to maintain a healthy weight. I think generally it's much better to eat whole food in its natural form. That's kind of my thing. I think when people do that, they, they feel better, they control their portions easily, they control their calories without even thinking about it. Please don't tell me just to drink water. Do you know what? We just need to drink two to three litres of water a day. We don't need that juice. Mindfulness is the meditation-based craze that has captured the world's imagination. But what exactly is it, and can we use it to make ourselves thin? Mindfulness. I love it. I absolutely love it. Mindfulness is really the idea of being present in the moment. Many of us now are eating on the go, and this can lead to us eating more. It can lead to us not recognising our body signals that we're full. There's so much power in mindfulness, even though it's a little bit of a buzzword. I think mindful eating is very important because you're tuning into all your senses and how often do you sit down and actually devour a whole bowl of food and forget what it actually tasted and what you actually ate? Mindfulness is all about reconnecting with our bodies and focusing attention on present moment experiences. If we apply this theory to slimming, it should allow us to make better food choices eat free from distraction and prevent us from overindulging. Eating is a beautiful experience. It's a beautiful experience and that experience has to be felt. What mindful eating does is it just helps you get back in tune with listening to the signals that your stomach is sending to your brain to say, hey, remember, I'm full now, I've had enough, thanks. And to do that, you need to give your body time. So actually, the science shows that you need to be making meals last at least 20 minutes long. So just taking the time to sit down and just eat. There's an exercise where you have to take a raisin or a palmful of raisins and you have to hold them and play with them and you sniff it and chew it and you have to remember and experience every single sensation and that's a way of reconnecting with your food. It's so repetitive and relentless that actually it's really hard to make every meal an event. Feel emotionally, mentally that you are eating and you're enjoying that food and that you are not going to be hungry. I tell you, a little food is going to fill you up. Okay, so maybe we can think ourselves full, but thinking ourselves full stone lighter? 
well, that probably requires more thought and less food. It's just having that presence, that mindfulness. Whatever activity you're doing, you have to be present with it. Otherwise, you're not going to enjoy it. So, if it is a case of mind over matter, how easy is it to think ourselves thin? I do believe, in fact, I know because I've been doing it for 30 years, if you can see yourself as thinner, if you can see your metabolic rate as higher, if you can see your appetite as selective, and if you can reactivate that normal relationship with food you were born with, you can be slim for the rest of your life and it's not work. Now, our next shocking fact could make master chefs out of all of us. Trawl up and down the aisles of any supermarket and you'll be overwhelmed by a sea of delicious looking healthy low fat meals. But guess what? Many are not nearly as good for us as they claim to be. So when people go on diets, there's a tendency to want convenience. So this is where people go and buy ready meals. Can I be honest with you? I don't like them. I mean, ready meals, they're just garbage. There's no nutrition in them. They're not cheap. They have so much of additives, sugar, salt. Usually the sugar's put in there because the taste is so awful otherwise. Just because something's labelled as low fat does not automatically make it healthier. You're looking at fats from things like nuts, seeds, avocado, oily fish. That's actually really good for you. But an item on a packet won't be able to say low fat because it contains, let's say, salmon in it, whereas it would be a better choice than your low fat option on the shelf as well. So get your chef's hat back on and start cooking up a healthy storm. That microwave might just have pinged its last ping. Every January, we are determined to make a healthy start to the new year after festive overindulgence. And one of the easiest ways to do this is by drinking the wide array of products claiming to give our bodies a detox. Well, here's the thing, you don't need them. We certainly have toxins in our system. Can we detox purely through food? No. You can buy all sorts of things now which purport to detox your body of things that are going to make you ill or worse. And I don't know how convinced I am about drinking little bottles of liquid that cost a huge amount of money or drinking juices that are going to detoxify your body. Detoxify your body of what? The idea that you have to actually drink something or eat something to help your body detoxify is in a complete marketing message and it's absolutely not true. You're detoxing, I'm detoxing as we speak. You don't need to do anything more. Our body is equipped to detox us, to get rid of the stuff we don't need. We've got fantastic organs, namely the liver and the kidneys, that will do that for us. So medically speaking, a detox is unnecessary. So if detox is so unnecessary, does that mean we can just eat and drink whatever we like? Our liver and kidneys are doing just fine, aren't they? There is no single food or single thing that you can do in order to detox. The only thing you really can do to support your liver with its detoxification process is to just eat an overall healthy, balanced diet. The liver actually does a good job itself of getting rid of toxins, uh, but we do overwhelm it, and you can do a lot of cleansing just by tidying up your diet, reducing sugar, reducing alcohol. There is research to show that if you cut alcohol out for an entire month, that your liver does completely recover and it is worth doing that and there is a positive effect on the body um, if you do do that. Let the body do what it's set up to do. Look after the body and the organs and believe me, they will look after you. Diabetes affects over 3.7 million people in the UK, a figure that has doubled in the last 20 years. Primary villains include our uber-sugary junk food diets and way too much time spent on our backsides. Type 2 diabetes cost to the NHS and lost productivity to the economy is currently around £20 billion per year. We can't ignore the epidemic of type 2 diabetes that's occurring. So in my own practice in 1986, when I joined as a young doctor, I think we had 57 patients with type 2 diabetes. And we've now got about 500. But before we get ahead of ourselves, what is diabetes exactly? Well, essentially, it's when our blood sugar levels are too high. Complications include stroke, kidney and heart disease, resulting in an estimated 500 deaths a week. 
Diabetes is a lifestyle disease, and that's because our lifestyles have changed dramatically, from hunter-gatherers walking 20 miles a day, to people even 30 years ago when children walked to school. There are very few physical jobs anymore, and people spend a long time sitting. When we measure people, only one in 20 actually does enough exercise. But recent research suggests type 2 diabetes can actually be reversed by going on a strict calorie-controlled diet for just eight weeks. But can a crash diet really halt diabetes? No one's really sure how it works, so it's thought that if you have a really massive calorie deficit, so effectively if you put your body almost in starvation, that the body then starts using the fat that's in the pancreas and in the liver preferentially. If you lose the fat out of your pancreas gland, it then begins to work and produce insulin in a more normal way. I think what happens for most patients is actually their diabetes is put into remission so that if they go back to eating as they ate before, then their blood sugars will climb. So in general, I, I prefer the idea of, of remission of type 2 diabetes rather than reversal. Following recent research, the NHS have announced a plan to put 5,000 patients on an 800-calorie liquid diet in a bid to reverse their type 2 diabetes. And if this proves successful, it's likely to be rolled out countrywide. Now, this is really exciting research, and certainly it appears that people with type 2 diabetes, if they lose a large amount of weight, so this could be around 10 kilograms, so it's a lot of weight, can actually normalise all of the functions that underlie type 2 diabetes. However, undertaking an extreme calorie controlled diet can be a serious challenge. So, not to be taken lightly then. Whilst I wouldn't normally advocate 800 calories a day, type 2 diabetes is so life shortening, it is so awful and costly, that if in eight weeks you can bring the blood sugar down, get the insulin levels under control, you can then go on to a more Mediterranean diet or a 5 2 method, which is sustainable. Coming up, why piling less food on our plates might be the real key to weight loss and why some breakfast cereals are not always that healthy. It's full of sugar. You might as well go and buy a packet of cookies, break them up and put them in milk, because that's what you're eating. There's no two ways about it. The UK is getting fatter. In a 2016 government report, over a quarter of the population was classified as obese by BMI or Body Mass Index, the most widely used measure of population weight. BMI is a crude way of assessing whether somebody is a healthy weight, overweight or obese. So you take your, your weight in kilograms, you divide it by your height in metres and you divide that again by your height in metres, and you, and you get a reading. These readings tell you whether you're underweight, a number between 15 and 18, normal weight, between 18 and 25, or overweight, between 25 and 30. However, one number cannot paint the whole picture. So let's use the example of a rugby player. A rugby player could be classified as morbidly obese if you just look at their BMI, whereas actually there's a lot of muscle mass there. What BMI fails to establish is what your weight is made of. So of your weight, how much is muscle and how much is fat? Now, that's really, really important because you can have a lot of muscle and weigh more, but actually be overweight. So it's really important that you don't just focus on body mass index, but actually you're looking at body composition as well. But if you're not a rugby player or a sumo wrestler and still hit the overweight category, it might be time to diet, right? People who are in the BMI category classed as overweight don't necessarily need to worry about their health. If they have no other health problems and if they're happy with their weight, we actually find that the healthiest BMI is around 27. That's right slap bang in the middle of overweight. 25 is overweight and 30 is obese. If you've got a BMI around 30 or less, you won't get many health benefits from losing weight. Losing weight does not guarantee better health. You can be a bit overweight and still be healthy. It's a question of down to the individual, I think, and what their lifestyle is. If they're eating healthily, they're being active, uh, and they're not smoking and all of those things, then the chances are they could be healthy, even though they might be carrying a few extra pounds. Are we worried about people's weight, or are we worried about how healthy they are? Because if 
the weight doesn't have this enormous correlation with how healthy an indivi one individual is, why are we obsessing all the time about what their BMI is or about what their, what their weight is? You know, it will, it will mean different things for different people. You can't tell how healthy someone is by looking at them or by looking on a graph of their BMI. BMI was designed as a population measure and it's useful for measuring millions of people. Giving individual feedback to school children at five and ten years old, telling them that they are overweight or obese based on a measure that was never designed to do that is a blatant misuse of BMI. Our bodies are 60% water and when we exercise we sweat profusely. But these days, rather than just topping up on the H2O, there's a sweeter alternative that we're lapping up. Sports drinks have been around for around 50 years. Most of them have a, a mix of uh, simple and more complex sugars so that they can maintain blood sugar at the normal level and allow you to exercise intensely. A lot of research has gone into sports drinks. They've got a good balance of salt, of carbohydrate, fuel you, give you energy. Now, if you're doing a lot of intensity running or you're doing high intensity exercise, you're going to lose water, you're going to lose electrolytes and sweat, so that's potassium and sodium, and you're going to need to replace your sugar levels because your blood sugar is going to drop. So sports drinks probably are more beneficial than water alone. Well, that's all pretty conclusive. Nothing more to say, is there? It's a complete con. There's a great um, sports drink, it's called water. And if you drink that, that will do everything you need and more. For the majority of us who are just trying to keep fit and go to the gym, we do not need sports drinks. We need to be filling our water bottles with water. The idea of things being isotonic or having the right levels of sugar and electrolytes is quite spurious if you're not a world-class athlete. If you're working out for less than 60 minutes and it's not in extreme temperatures, then water is as good as anything. It feeds your body and it gives you exactly what you need. The only time you need a sports drink is if it's extremely warm, long distance running, extreme sports like that. But otherwise, save your pennies and go to the water fountain. You can make your own sports drink. So all you would need is a bit of sugar, which could be, say, some orange juice. You have the same proportion of water, so you'd have half orange juice, half water, or maybe a little bit more water. And then you also need to replenish what we call electrolytes, which are the micronutrients like potassium and sodium. If you just put a little bit of salt, mix it all up, you've got a sports drink. There is also natural sports drinks. A watermelon, for example, is probably one of the best things you can eat post a long endurance event because it's full of water and it's also got loads of nutrients in it as well. So I'd say have a watermelon. Sports drinks have been marketed incredibly well and have really fed into people's ideas, but there's no scientific evidence that they are needed by your average person going to the gym. Next, fancy starving yourself to a longer, healthier life? Well, severe calorie restriction worked well enough for our cavemen ancestors. Fasting has a long history in our society. It's deeply embedded in many religious practices. It's a way of demonstrating that we're civilised and morally worthy. So there is this association sometimes that when you don't eat, you're being good and you're doing yourself good. And there can be, for some people, this link between eating and punishment. Food is a lot more complex than just what we eat. It's the psychological implications behind it that make it so complicated. Our bodies aren't like cars. They're not only able to use petrol or diesel. Our bodies are designed to use a blend of fuels that we can get from a mixed diet, which we historically have got by what we can find. The problem is now we have too much we can find, and that might be the issue. But of course, you don't have to starve all the time to lose weight. You can do it for just two days a week, with surprisingly effective results. You have five days where you're eating healthily and normally, and then two days where you're fasting or reducing your intake on those two days to a third of your caloric intake. I, I don't think it takes uh, you know, a genius to work out that if you're going to fast, for two days out of seven, um, you're going to probably end up eating less overall. My worry about the 5-2 diet and all other fasting diets is that for two days a week you're in a really bad mood and you're thinking about food the whole time. In most normal lives, that is phenomenally unrealistic to say you're going to fast because 
you do not feel good when you're fasting. You, know, you do not have energy. You don't have the same sort of cognitive function. You're going to struggle. For some people, intermittent fasting does seem to work and they seem to like it. So perhaps people who have that more all or nothing approach to eating. For other people, it just isn't a style that suits them. One potential fly in the ointment with a 5-2 diet and all fasting diets is the tendency to gorge on the non-calorie restricted days. For the people for whom it works well are the people that don't then overeat on the days that they're not fasting. They're able to regulate themselves quite well. If you have had an eating disorder or you know that going on a fasting diet is likely to lead to you restricting the rest of the time, then it's not an approach for you. And not only is it quantity of food you need to watch, but also quality. Are they doing the other things? Are they getting the nuts in every day and the non-starchy vegetables and the olive oil? It puts more emphasis on the food that is consumed and that food being dense in terms of the nutrients. Dieting is never easy, so wouldn't it be great if you could just pop a pill and simply watch that weight drop off? Well, you can, but at the very real risk of losing much more than a few pounds. People are really looking for quick fixes nowadays, so diet pills are ever popular, as they always have been. There's really only now one diet pill that we do prescribe, which isn't dangerous, but it is unpleasant because it makes you poo all the fat that you've eaten, which is pretty horrible, I'm told. There are some medications that are known as fat binders. The idea being is that they bind to the fat and the fat gets excreted. So if you are having a high fat meal, you wouldn't absorb all of the fat from that meal. Pooing out the weight may seem extreme, but at least those pills can be prescribed by your GP. A much more disturbing phenomenon is the rise in people buying unregulated pills online. Of course, if you're buying diet pills online or from somewhere which is not recognised as a healthcare facility, then you don't know what you're getting. Some of them can be very dangerous. I worked on a project where we got some pills from the internet and when we analysed them, they were 100 and 50% of the dose that was actually stated. So if you'd taken those tablets, you would have getting 50% more of this dangerous ingredient than you thought you were taking. The worst case scenario with a diet pill, if you don't know what it is or where it's from, is actually death. Some diet pills contain amphetamines, some contain herbs that can make you go into liver failure. So that really is a potential complication of buying a diet pill if you don't know what it is. The trouble with diet pills is that they are not increasing anybody's motivation or anybody's willpower. So you still have that problem day in, day out of maintaining the diet and really motivating yourself. And unfortunately, there isn't a quick fix for that. With so much going on in our lives, who has time to prepare an elaborate breakfast? The convenience of cereal has made it the first meal of the day for millions of us. And of course, it's really healthy, isn't it? We have a real problem with hidden sugars in our food, and cereals are an absolute menace when it comes to this. It's full of sugar, and believe me, cereal and milk, you might as well go and buy a packet of cookies, break them up, put them in milk, because that's what you're eating. A small bowl of cornflakes is six to eight teaspoons of sugar there before you've added the sugar on top. They do have value because, of course, they'll be fibre. Many of them are, are fortified, so actually they do have nutrients added to them. But if you were having a different breakfast, perhaps you wouldn't necessarily need those nutrients added in artificially. I think cereals have been oversold to us over the years. It's a, a marketing thing that we've all fallen for. And not satisfied with selling their sugary products for us to eat at home, those clever food companies came up with a new way to enjoy breakfast on the go. I think the breakfast cereal bars are a real problem because a typical cereal bar contains around 450, 500 calories per 100 grams, and a well-known four-fingered chocolate snack contains 520. So 
calorie-wise, they're not that different. So when you take your cereal bar that you think has got lots of wholesome ingredients and the packet shows pictures of nuts and fruits and seeds and all those sorts of things, what you're not realising is you are taking in a lot of sugar with cereal bars and they're probably not as healthy for you as you might think. My real problem with cereal bars per se is the idea really of eating on the go. This is what's not good for us. We're rushing out the door and eating as we run to catch a bus, which to be honest, of course the calories are the same going in, but you've very quickly forgotten that you've eaten anything and that's not any form of sustainable food. It's one thing trying to work out what's healthy and what isn't when it comes to filling our plates. But perhaps the harder question is, just how much should we be serving up? Portion sizes probably are far too big in this country. If you look at the portion sizes from the 1970s and the 1980s, they were much smaller than they are now. Over 20 years, for instance, your, your favourite Indian ready meal has gone up by 50% in its portion size. Shepherd's pie for one by 98%, lasagna by 39%. And I think this establishes a new norm. We get used to larger portions. People want value for money and then they expect large portions and so it's self-perpetuating. Portion sizes have definitely increased, the size of our plates have definitely increased and as a result we're just getting bigger and bigger as a nation. But if bigger portions are making us fatter, why not just stop when we've had enough? I think we've lost the ability of just listening to our own bodies and our own bodies are very good at telling us when we're hungry and when we're full. And I think we do have a tendency to overeat because we think we should, because we don't like wasting food. Your stomach is the size of your fist, so really two mugfuls of food is enough to fill anyone up. But when you have huge portions, you stretch out your stomach. And then when you eat a lot, you tend to require a lot all the time. So it should be small portions. So how do we make sure that we've got both the right quality and quantity of food? I think we need to teach children and adults that actually you don't have to finish a portion rather than the post-war generation who were always taught to finish the food on their plate. Actually, it might not be a portion size for you. The best way of overcoming this is actually to have a similar looking size portion, but put it on a smaller plate. If people want huge plates of food that are full, then actually filling them up with salads and vegetables, particularly if you're dieting, is the way to do it. Coming up, we reveal that exercise can really stink and going on a crash diet can make you even fatter. Nine times out of ten, someone who goes on a crash diet will regain the weight afterwards. They basically set you up to fail each time. For nearly 15,000 years, humans have been enjoying booze. The ancient Greeks sometimes even had it with their breakfast. But these days, it seems we don't go a week without a new study trying to uncover the truth about alcohol and our health. Alcohol sort of comes and goes in fashion terms, whether it's good for you or bad for you. Research has shown time and time again that a moderate amount of booze is actually good for your psychological well-being. At a certain age group, so middle age group, 45 years to 65, actually having one unit of alcohol a day decreases your risk of coronary heart disease, which at that age group is the biggest killer. Alcohol can be part of a healthy lifestyle. The Mediterranean diet includes some red wine. A typical example, one that's often cited, is red wine. Red wine is good for you. It contains polyphenols, which are also found in green tea and cocoa, but to be honest, no one's ever said, I'm going to have a glass of red wine because I want the antioxidants. There are, are certain benefits to drinking a glass of red wine, but just drinking one glass of red wine will give you those benefits. You don't need to drink the whole bottle. And there's the rub. You can have too much of a good thing. You just don't do moderation well with alcohol. Um, we drink too much and we binge drink, which is the worst type of drinking. So there's lots of links with drinking too much alcohol and particularly cancer. We're advised not to have more than 14 units a week. And when you consider that a 250 milliliter glass of wine will contain three units, it's very easy to have two glasses of wine in an evening and have six units and do that several times a week and more at weekends. And we're also not the best at being honest about just how much we drink each week, either with ourselves or our GP. 
We have a joke as health professionals that we say if someone reports how much they're drinking to you, double it. <laughs> when I see a client in a clinical situation and we talk about how much they drink, for instance, um, I think we both know, I know and they know, they're not quite telling the truth. It's not a judgment. I think that it's not because they mean to mislead me or anyone else. They, I think it's just that they underestimate it. So is it really worth trying to boost your health by adding a little alcohol to your diet? Because it's so easy to overindulge with alcohol and then experience the negative effects, the trade-off of including alcohol for the health benefits is probably not there. This one may not be bad for you, but could definitely be unpleasant for the people around you. Exercise makes you fart. Whether it's running, weightlifting, yoga or sit-ups, with all those contracting muscles and increased abdominal pressure, we're talking a Force 8 bum gale. I think it does happen in classes quite quite a lot, and it can create giggles. There's a reason that people uh, burn um, <laughs> nice oils in classes. Passing wind, farting, it's normal. 12 times a day, 15 times a day, 30 times a day. If people are putting themselves into different positions and different shapes, you're more likely to push that air through our system. I often call them Pilates farty Pilates for a reason. The real problem is because a lot of people in the gym have a he heavy protein diet and protein shakes that can make your farts stink. Is there any way you can lessen the possibility of stepping on a duck whilst you're working out? It's much better to release it, because you try and hold it in and you're going to get cramps and it's going to feel uncomfortable. And I'm always taken back to what my, my dad used to say, you know, wherever you might be, let your wind go free. Oof, better out than in. Next, a food sinner that might actually be a saint. Carbs are often the most vilified food group and associated with weight gain, and wrongly so. Actually, it's all about the quality and the quantity of the carbohydrate and when we utilise them. But a quick science lesson first. Carbs are one of three macronutrients found in food in the form of starches, sugars and fibres and are often classified as either complex or simple. Complex carbohydrates being the ones that are broken down more slowly in the digestive system, they tend to have more fiber. Simple carbohydrates have less fiber and therefore they're broken down from food to glucose quite rapidly. Your body can't tell the difference between these it, different sugars, it processes them all the same way. But you need carbohydrate in order for your cognitive function, for thinking and concentration. I know that anyone that's been on a diet and gives them up can feel a little bit grumpy and it can affect our mood. 90% of our serotonin is created in our gut, that is our happy hormone, but the remaining percent comes from our diet and carbohydrates are one of the key contributors to this happy hormone and our mood. Our brain also can only utilise glucose for fuel and that essentially glucose is carbohydrate. But carbs make us fat and sluggish, don't they? But the question is, is it carbs or is it fats that are making us fatter? And it's a very difficult question, that, because so many foods, unfortunately, some of the worst foods, in include fats and carbohydrates in a delicious, irresistible mix. Carbs are definitely not the devil. It's about making sure you're choosing the right types of carbohydrates and that you're eating them in the right proportion and at the right time. So are there really good carbs and bad carbs? I don't think it's particularly helpful to call things good carbs and bad carbs because in some situations simple carbohydrates which are sometimes seen as the bad carbs are extremely beneficial. They're a very quick source of energy and sometimes we need that. It's often forgotten that green vegetables are a source of carbohydrate. So broccoli is a great source of carbohydrate. Broccoli is an example of a food that has a ton of carbohydrate fiber in it that feeds our gut bugs and gut bugs are critical for our health. I know some people will think that I'm absolutely mad to say this, but I think carbohydrates are really valuable food. If they're taken sensibly, they're fantastic. Basmati rice, whole grain bread, high fibre cereal. Sweet potatoes, parsnips, carrots, cauliflower. I think these are incredibly tasty foods. For me personally, I find them incredibly tasty, but they're also very, very healthy foods for our body. Yes, bring them on. They're healthy, you can eat them to lose weight, no question. You hear the word superfood being banded around all over the shop these days. 
Turmeric is very much the superfood du jour. A goji berry is a berry, funnily enough. Blueberries are probably the one that springs to mind. Some people claim eating a diet rich in so-called superfoods can not only improve our general well-being, but also prevent or even cure many serious diseases. There is no real such thing as a superfood. Superfood is entirely a marketing term. There is no real scientific evidence that there are some foods that we actually have to consume in order to be healthy. If you eat a lot of turmeric, you're not necessarily going to eat, lose the weight. If you eat cayenne pepper or lemons, none of these things will lead to weight loss. In 2007, the EU banned use of the word superfood to prevent false claims not backed up by credible scientific evidence. However, they are still touted as miracle foods, capable of slowing down the aging process and even curing cancer. It's a bit like taking the alphabet and saying that the letter Q and the letter T are super and the rest are not as super. You need the whole of the letters of the alphabet to communicate, just as you need a wide spectrum of foods to be healthy. I suspect that uh, we might think a goji berry or something from Brazil is a superfood, and in Brazil they probably think broccoli from Northamptonshire is a superfood as well. They can be healthy choices, but it doesn't mean that it cancels other things out. If you're having a chocolate pudding with goji berries sprinkled on it, you're still eating chocolate pudding. So whilst it's likely eating a balanced diet is of more benefit to our overall health than any one specific superfood, there are some foods proven to help certain conditions. When it comes to heart disease, there are some clear consistent evidence of benefit with certain foods that are going to protect the heart. Oily fish for its omega-3, polyphenols and other fatty acids that are found in vegetables and nuts, for example. So for me, I don't think we should go down this superfood definition. I mean, what, if people eat healthy, nutritious food, then effectively all food is superfood. After the Christmas festivities, a glut of turkey, chocolates and sweet sherry, millions of us every new year vow to go on a crash diet. But don't bother, because guess what? They just make you fatter. Crash diets and fast diets and fed diets are so appealing because they promise instant weight loss, rapid weight loss. Certainly crash dieting is a quick fix. Certainly if you crash diet and you drastically reduce the number of calories you take in, you will lose some fat, of course, but they are completely unsustainable. You can lose some weight in a short space of time. Whether it's healthy or not is a completely different matter. One of the real classics, I'm going on a crash diet, I want to get into a dress for a wedding. When you look six months after the wedding, is someone still able to get into that dress? Rarely. It's not just would-be brides that fall for the quick fix. Remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is a crash diet. There's actually quite a lot of data out there that people who go on diets which calorie restrict, most of those people regain the weight within a few years that they lost, and many of those actually end up heavier than they started. So actually, crash dieting in many respects makes people fatter. Crash diets do make you fat. Yo-yo dieting does mess up your metabolism because what you're doing is you're going from extreme to overeating, extreme to overeating. Nine times out of 10, someone who goes on a crash diet will regain the weight afterwards and yo-yo dieting is actually more dangerous than keeping maintaining the same weight that someone started with. There's actually good evidence showing this can be very harmful in, re in increasing heart attack risk, high blood pressure and type two diabetes. One clear famous example of this is Tom Hanks, the actor who came out publicly and said that he developed type 2 diabetes. And this was linked to roles which he'd been playing where he'd be constantly either gaining weight or losing weight. Crash diets are no fun. They're no substitution for a healthy lifestyle, as they basically set you up to fail each time, which is going to continually impact on your mood and your self-esteem. Crash dieting doesn't address, one, the reason why you're overweight in the first place, and two, how you can lose weight and maintain a healthy weight long-term for the rest of your life. For many people, the most effective way to get into shape is to join a local gym. But beware, you may end up in your local A&E with a broken back. It can be really dangerous in the gyms. So people have easily broken bones, broken arms, broken feet. Exercise puts a lot of strain on your body. That's pretty much the point of it. And unless you do it properly, you are going to end up with all sorts of different injuries. The worst is squats, uh, doing the squat rack. When you put in 100 kilograms weight on your back or more and you're squatting, if you're not doing that right, you can really put your back out and you can be out for 12 months a year. You, you know, you could, you could be out forever, basically. 
Damaged backs are one of the most common gym injuries and contribute to a mind-blowing 7.6 million working days lost every year in the UK through back pain. One of the most debilitating results of an abused back is a slip disc. But what is it? Now, I want you to think of a disc as a donut. So as we do a lot of bending forward, we do a lot of that, don't we? And as we continue doing that, what happens is that the jam is going to find its way out to the back. And then once it's come out, can you see it's coming out? That is supposed to be right in the center here. Now, bending forward, as we do many times a day, is going to encourage that jam to come out of the back. You have to be careful with your bending forward. You have to be careful with picking up things. You have to use your legs. You've got strong muscles in your thigh. Use them rather than your back. It's not just ignorance of the right exercise techniques that can do damage. In recent years, another trend has become almost as deadly, social media. Many people like nothing more than posing in their best gym kit for an Insta selfie, a Facebook post, or just to impress someone you might fancy at the gym. Holding a phone while working out is very likely to lead to toppling over and causing an injury. I'm guilty of it myself. I was posing, getting ready to, for somebody to take a picture of me, sat with the weights on my knee, just ready to pose, lift it up. And as I did it, I dropped the dumbbell and broke my finger, which is just about healed. So aside from leaving our mobiles at home, how can we aid gym-induced damage to our bodies? The main reason why people get injured is because they don't know their own body. And technique is everything. Best thing is to get a really good instructor to train you. Also, look at training regimes that have a really good historical, um, technical background to them. Things like Pilates, things that actually have a system where you know that you're going to be taught how to hold yourself properly, how to use really, really good technique. Or wouldn't it be just easier and safer to give the gym a miss and put our feet up at home? Sitting down is the biggest killer of all. So if you have a sedentary lifestyle outside of the gym, that in itself is more likely to, to give you the in injury and contribute to that gym injury, not just the gym itself. You can't beat a good run. No expensive gym required, calorie shedding, stress busting and heart pumping. What's not to love? Ah, on your skid marks, get set, go. Yup, it's joggers trots. Runners trots are more common than people will admit. I think the most famous example was in 2005, poor Paula Radcliffe running the London Marathon. She'd had a bit of a dodgy stomach and she realised that she needed to go. But she was on track for gold and nothing was going to stop her, so she just squatted by the side of the road, did a little poo and just ran on. I think if you're Paula Radcliffe and you're going for a London Marathon win and you're going for a world record time, which I think she was, then a little poo on the side of the road is kind of acceptable, just. But I think for your average runner, you know, it's not really acceptable to poo yourself. Despite her very public miscrap, Paula went on to win the race. An estimated 71% of long-distance runners get the squits at some point. But why do so many runners find themselves bringing up the diarrhoea? The bouncing motion of your stomach going up and down while you run. Being dehydrated can cause it. Drinking a lot of caffeine. Uh, and also runner's nerves as well. Very often, people will train their muscles in training but don't train their gut. So you almost need to train your gut so that it understands and is able to process sugar as in the form of gels or sports drinks so that when race day comes, it's not doing something it's never done before. So there you have it. Plenty of good advice of how not to get caught short in your shorts. Well, we're on the home stretch. Join us shortly for some big fat lies that will make you gym bunnies hopping mad. Gyms are absolutely riddled with bacterias, viruses. 70% of the bacteria that are isolated from a gym are ones that can cause illness in humans. If you've got a sweet tooth, look away now, because sugar might just be the new cocaine. Sugar is a very controversial topic at the moment, and we do need to be reducing the overall amount the nation is eating. We've just sleepwalked as a society into a situation where we've just let sugar creep into our diets and creep into our foods and not questioned why manufacturers are using so much. 
Over the last 100 years, our annual sugar intake has doubled, and it's not just because we're eating more cakes and sweets. Added sugar is a key ingredient of many processed low-fat foods. When they take the fat out of the product and they're processing the food, they then add in other ingredients such as extra sugar, which is being now shown to be detrimental to health. Sugar is directly converted into fat in the body as soon as it is absorbed, and it is virtually non-beneficial to our bodies in any other way. Sugar is simply an instant energy source that is converted to fat. The World Health Organization recommends a maximum limit per day of no more than six teaspoons of added sugar in one's diet. But just to put it in perspective, a typical chocolate bar, without naming any brands, or a can of cola, has almost, you know, one and a half times, has about nine teaspoons of sugar. On average, we consume three times that recommended daily amount. Surely it's time to just say no. According to some experts, it's not that easy. There are studies out now which prove biochemically and medically that sugar is addictive. It is a very difficult cycle to get out of, it's compulsive, and worst of all, it is all around us. You can pick it up on every single street corner. The evidence around sugar addiction is very controversial. Some studies have shown that actually it lights up the reward centers in your brain, and yet other studies have shown that actually it's not addictive. Sugar is not something that causes a chemical dependency in our brains because we kind of need food in order to survive, so calling something that's a food substance addictive isn't particularly helpful. And also, if you feel that you have um, a sugar craving, you can actually cure that with something that isn't sugar. You can cure that with just eating a balanced meal. You can't say the same thing about drugs, for example. That is a very, very specific dependency. It's not the same way with sugar. Can somebody be addicted in the same way they can be addicted to drugs or alcohol? Probably not. However, you can have very strong, intense cravings for sugary foods, just like you can have cravings for things like alcohol and drugs. So it's a kind of a grey area. Can you be an addict? I doubt you can be a true addict. Can you experience cravings? Absolutely. The thing to get right with sugar is moderating it. How can you include sugar in your diet in places where you're choosing to, eat, to add that sugar rather than you're relying on it? For over 30 years, diet law has judged fat to be the biggest food criminal. Eat less of it and you'll be slimmer and healthier. Well, it looks like there may have been a serious miscarriage of justice. The low-fat diet myth is about to be dispelled if it hasn't already. Cutting out fat, I do not believe anymore, is the right way to lose weight. I think we should be putting in actually more healthy fats into our diet. People are still very much ingrained in this notion that fat is something to be scared of. A patient I saw recently, me encouraging to eat foods like avocados, nuts and olives, she was worried that that was going to help her put on weight because they're fatty foods. Fat is not something to be scared of. Every cell in our body, every single cell, it's got an outer coating, the cell membrane, that's made of fat, right? Fat is critical for our health. So if fat is so good for us, why all the fuss about it being bad for our health? There was a lot of research around the 70s into heart disease and there was a correlation between fat and heart disease. What wasn't recognised then was smoking and smoking being such a huge cause of heart disease. And what's fascinating now is that smoking has really decreased. Low-fat diet's really gone up, and we have a really high rate of both obesity and heart disease. And it looks now more and more like it was the smoking and the heart disease that was the link, and the fat was the red herring. But like most food in our diet, too much of a good thing can be bad for us. And to complicate things further, not all fats are created equal. Saturated fats are found mainly in animal products, so your butter, cream, and in red meat. The key with saturated fat is it tastes so good, so you've got to get the balance and the portion size of saturated fat right, because if you eat too much saturated fat, then therein lies the problem. Unsaturated fats are plant-based fats, so olive oil would be a type of unsaturated fat, avocado, nuts and seeds. So those fats are good for us, and we need to include them in our diet. However, it's all about portion control. You can't kind of liberally <laughs> sprinkle it on absolutely everything. So as long as we keep an eye on our intake of the right fats, it can be beneficial to our health. Fat was demonized, particularly in the 80s, simply because we really like a simple narrative. 
And so by saying fat was the problem, it gave us a really simple narrative when unfortunately in nutrition, nothing is particularly simple. Joining a gym tops many people's New Year's resolutions, but the billion-pound gym industry is the beneficiary of £37 million a year on membership we never use. That's a staggering £558 per member. So do we really need to join a gym in order to fight the flab? Gyms offer facilities, they offer classes, and they are a really great place for people who may be a bit nervous about starting exercise or maybe getting back into exercise after they've had a break from it, and it's a really great jumping off point. Obviously, a gym membership is only worth it if you actually go. Are we being dazzled by all those shiny state-of-the-art machines in a cynical ploy to make us part with our hard-earned cash? I think gyms are marketed really well in this country, and for many people do a lot of good, but the hard sell in January with a membership really does almost trick some people to join. For us regular gym goers, it's the worst time. We hate them. We hate those people that join and we can't get on our equipment in January because it's rammed with a sea of new people. We all think that if we pay money for something, we've got that direct debit going out every month, then obviously we're going to commit to it. Realistically, if you've not been a gym member before, you're not going to suddenly start going four times a week. But if you don't work out in the gym, what is the alternative? The gym itself does not necessarily mean that you're suddenly going to dramatically change your lifestyle, because you've got to get there and you've got to actually like it. Whereas you can play netball, you can play any team event, you could go to a dance class, you could just go for a walk with a group of friends and you've done a bit of exercise and you're therefore that much more likely to do it again because you actually enjoyed it. A final word of caution though, if you do decide to join your local fitness factory, you might end up in A&E with a nasty case of superbug RSA, which causes boils, joint infections and even pneumonia. Some of the problems with gyms is they can be full of sweat and bacteria, and bacteria love to grow in warm and wet areas. Gyms are absolutely riddled with bacteria, viruses. I mean, really, I think 70% of the bacteria that are isolated from a gym are ones that can cause illness in humans. Yes, germs thrive in the warm, sweaty environment of a gym. And bacteria and fungus found in changing rooms, showers and on gym equipment can give you everything from athlete's foot, verrucas and colds to tummy upsets and streptococcal infections. There should be facilities at your gym to wipe down exercise machines. There should be like a spray and paper towel. If not, ask for some. And worse yet, you could end up carrying these into your home in that bubbling cauldron of nastiness, otherwise known as your gym bag. I think kit bags are a bit of a breeding ground for germs. Uh, we don't think about washing out our gym bag. We wash our kit, but maybe not the gym bag. And then those trainers that go in the gym bag, oh my goodness. So wipe down the machines, don't share towels, clean your bits, and for goodness sake, wash your gym bag as well as your kit, or who knows what you might catch. OK, so we've uncovered the truth about almost every lie told to us about diets and exercise. One massive question still remains. Do diets work? That's a $64,000 question, isn't it? OK, you're not going to like this answer. Diets don't work. They never work. Diets generally are a complete waste of time. Essentially, diet means what you eat every day, what you do that's unique to you. However, I think it's now seen as a term for weight loss. And unfortunately, quick fixes and most dietary changes are not sustainable. And research does suggest that the majority of people put the weight back on, and actually even more so. A lot of people, myself included, who've been on a diet will find that the diet itself was successful. You get to your goal. The problem is always the maintenance of that goal, and you see this with whatever dietary technique you use, whether it's slimming groups or shakes or this or that. It's always the long term that people struggle with. I don't think anybody's got the answer to that yet. So if diets don't work, how will we ever get into shape? It's about finding an eating pattern that suits your lifestyle and what you want to achieve. So you shouldn't have to go onto a diet and then come off a diet. You just need to find a way of eating that's just a new normal for you. Most of us don't become overweight 
because we don't know what to do or we don't understand about healthy eating, we become overweight and stay overweight because we have a poor relationship with food. Maintaining a healthy weight is down to simply eating when you're hungry, not eating rubbish, not eating when you're not hungry and taking a bit of moderate exercise. I think there's a huge industry built around dieting and all the different things that go with it and I think we're being taken for a bit of a ride. <laughs>